This is the second video for Chapter 1. In this video, we'll discuss some ways that biologists think about the organization of life. A fundamental concept that we'll encounter over and over again is that systems have emergent properties that aren't exhibited by the parts that make up those systems. For example, atoms are the basic units of matter. There are more than a hundred elements, that is, different kinds of atoms, but only a couple of dozen are found in the bodies of living organisms, and only six of those are present in appreciable quantity. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Atoms combine together in many different combinations to form molecules. For example, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom can combine to form H2O, a water molecule. We, s we can see an emergent property here. Neither hydrogen atoms nor oxygen atoms have the same amazing properties as does water. Smaller molecules can combine to form larger molecules. Here again, we can see emergent properties. For example, when one amino acid called aspartic acid, which tastes sour, is combined with a second amino acid called phenylalanine, which tastes bitter, the molecule aspartame is produced. Aspartame is better known as the intensely sweet artificial sweetener called NutraSweet. Sour plus bitter equals sweet? Uh, that's an emergent property of, of a system of two molecules. In living organisms, various types of molecules can combine with one another to form cellular parts called organelles. We'll learn about the structure and functions of many organelles, including the nucleus, which you might have heard of, and things like peroxisomes and ribosomes and the Golgi apparatus, which maybe you haven't heard of yet. Cellular parts, including the organelles we just discussed, combine together to form cells. Cells are the basic units of life. All living things are made of one or more cells. As we'll see in lab, even single cells are capable of pretty amazing things. And then, when you take microbiology, you'll learn about the diversity and the com commonalities among cells in much more detail. Many cells combine to form layers called tissues, and different tissues combine to form organs, like the heart and the spleen. And organs work together to form organ systems, like the digestive system. We'll do a little bit of microscopic investigation of tissues in our lab. Then, when you go on to take anatomy and physiology, you'll learn about cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems of the human body in much more detail. So in our class, we'll focus on the levels of organization on the left side of this picture, atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, and tissues. And that'll serve as a foundation of knowledge on which you'll build more knowledge in microbiology and in anatomy and physiology. I'll let you learn about the higher levels of biological organization on the right side of this slide as part of your reading. Well, here's a quick challenge for you. Think of something you know well. Music, sports, cooking, video games, whatever. Describe a system of parts associated with that thing and describe the emergent properties of that system. After you've done that, here's another challenge. Take any level of biological organization on this slide and give an example of that level and how it builds into a biological system at the next level. Now describe emergent properties of that system. If you're confident in your responses to these challenges, good on you. If you're not sure, come to class and ask me about it. Well, let's move on to the next slide. Another way that biologists try to organize their knowledge of life is by categorizing organisms. This categorization is called a taxonomy. In biology, we use a taxonomical scheme that was developed in the 1700s by Carl Linnaeus. You'll also find his name as Carolus Linnaeus and Carl von Linn. Linnaean taxonomy consists of a hierarchy or nested set of groupings, starting from the broadest grouping called the kingdom. Linnaeus thought that there were two kingdoms, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. We now know that there are a few more, including the fungus kingdom. Within each kingdom are groupings of progressively more similar organisms, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and down to species, groups of potentially interbreeding organisms. Well, here's another challenge for you. To get an idea of how these groupings work, find and compare the tax taxonomic classifications, that is, the names for the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, 
for each of the following. Gray wolf, which you see on the uh, slide, coyotes, kit foxes, domestic cats, and bullfrogs. Again, if you have questions about this challenge, come to class and we'll discuss. You'll notice that I haven't discussed the grouping called domain. That's because Linnaeus didn't invent this category. The level called domain was developed by a geneticist named Carl Woese in the 1990s. Woese compared the genes of lots of organisms to try to make our system of biological classification reflect actual relatedness among organisms, rather than just grouping uh, together organisms on the basis of their looks. That is, Woese tried to base our system of classification on phylogenetics. Woese reasoned that organisms that have lots of genetic similarity must be more closely related than organisms with less genetic similarity, like brother and sister are more genetically similar than are two random people picked out of a crowd. When Woese obtained the genetic data, he found something remarkable. We animals are very genetically similar to plants and even more similar to fungi. And there are some microorganisms that are really genetically dissimilar to each other. Woese concluded that if we want to continue to classify ourselves in different kingdoms from plants and fungi, then we need another broader grouping to properly classify those mi microorganisms. So he developed the grouping called the domain and identified three groups, domain eukarya, organisms made of cells that have nuclei, and domain bacteria and domain archaea, two domains of single-celled microorganisms that lack nuclei. In a phylogenetic tree, like the one shown here, the closer two branch points are to one another, the more genetically related those two groups are to one another, and each branch point represents a common ancestor. In this way, a phylogenetic tree is constructed similarly to a family tree. Well, that's it for now. See you in the next video.